Tonight on Nova, in May 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted, destroying trees, moving a lake, and turning scientific theory upside down. We'd develop our ideas and concepts and theories, and then would come in here and nature would just knock them on their pins. Now, scientists have had more than 10 years to study, and Mother Nature has had 10 years to renew. The surprising legacy of a volcano Return to Mount St. Helens. Funding for NOVA is provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management, and technology services for defense, space, and industry. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. The vast forest expanse of the Cascade Mountain Range stretches unbroken for hundreds of miles. But the peace and tranquility here are deceptive. The ancient forests and new timber grow on top of one of the most powerful and destructive forces of nature, a volcano. Beneath the forest floor, deep within the earth, that catastrophic force lies in wait like a time bomb ready to go off. St. Helens last erupted in 1857. In 1980, after two months of small earthquakes and warning tremors, her power, searing rock and boiling water, roared down the mountain. The avalanche turned to mud, forcing its way down rivers and valleys, filling them. The eruption that followed the landslide spewed 150 million tons of ash across the breadth of the continent. One day later, the peak and the north face had vanished, leaving a horseshoe-shaped crater two kilometers across and 600 meters deep with a seething cauldron at its center. 25 kilometers from the mountain, full-grown forest had been torn asunder. It looked as though everything living and breathing among the trees had been destroyed. The volcano had dumped tons of scorching pumice across the mountain's flanks, reducing them to a sterile plain. In the aftermath of the eruption, hundreds of scientists flooded the area. Overnight, Mount St. Helens had become a rich and fertile natural laboratory right in their own backyard. It was the chance of a lifetime. For over 10 years, scientists have been studying the world of Mount St. Helens. And they have been learning how life is returning to the mountain. The first time we went up, I couldn't do anything. I was just absolutely couldn't do any work at all. I was just spellbound, looking at this sort of primordial environment and just expecting that at any time it could go off again. It was unique in my experience and uh, probably will, will remain so. Uh, I was re really overpowered by the events, but at the same time uh, awestruck by um, the quality of the science that could be done and what we could learn from the events. For me, the major thing that's come out of, uh, of watching Mount St. Helens this past decade, studying it, 
has been uh, a renewed appreciation of the resiliency of nature and the many ways in which she has of dealing with catastrophe. An infrared aerial photograph of the mountain taken before the eruption shows vegetation colored red. One week after the explosion, the hot gas and pumice had fanned out for seven kilometers. The avalanche and mud flows followed the main river valley for 25. The blast spread over 500 square kilometers. Beyond the blast zone is a zone where trees remain standing but scorched to death. Today, the pumice plains and the flanks of the volcano itself have been cut through by streams pouring down from the melting snow at the summit. The sides of these new canyons, 100 meters deep, show the strata of old rock that has been covered by new in the many eruptions of St. Helens' explosive past. very breach of the crater is the most terrifying landform created by the mountain, one that is entirely new, the dome. In 1980, the first dome formed in the crater floor, an upwelling of lava crust from the magma body that had forced the mountain to explode. Barely 50 meters high, it was blasted away by later eruptions, and fresh rock has gradually grown in a series of dome-building events. Watch the top right-hand part of the dome in this time-lapse film from an eruption over one day in 1986. Fresh magma extrudes like thousand-degree toothpaste. Today, the dome is 270 meters high and a kilometer across. It would reach two-thirds of the way up the World Trade Center in New York. The dome is the very inside of the Earth made visible. Steam and sulfur still belch from fissures and boulders the size of skyscrapers. Understanding the growth of the dome has been the key to predicting the future behavior of the mountain. Since the big blast in 1980, the U.S. Geological Survey has become very good at predicting subsequent eruptions of the mountain. So far, there have been 17 of them. We became adept at predicting eruptions of St. Helens because we, had, we saw the same precursory pattern before each eruption. So it didn't take us too long to realize that and thereby the next time that we saw the pattern to then be able to foresee what that pattern was going to lead to. Seismic readings, deformation of the ground, gas emissions, gravity measurements, and magnetism all took on characteristic patterns before each fresh eruption. As rock cools below a temperature of 450 degrees, it becomes magnetic. So magnetometer readings can be used to measure its temperature deep inside. The dome is cooling now, but it will be 30 years before its center becomes magnetic. To go here, get it centered up. Laser rangers time the reflection of a beam of light bounced off a target okay. to measure any swelling of the dome before an eruption. By predicting the rates of change of the seismicity and the deformation, uh, we were able to make predictions as to when the events were taking place. This is something that um, 
uh, is essentially unique to St. Helens, at least in, in the experience of volcanologists. This may, not dwell, this may not be exportable to other volcanoes necessarily, but here at St. Helens it certainly worked, worked wonderfully. Today there are constant echoes of rock falls from the crumbling crater rim. The smell of sulfur and blasts of steam and gas make it seem like hell itself. The dome is one of the strangest places on Earth. Dome here has grown episodically at 17 or 18 different events, sort of stacking one lava flow on top of the other. And you might think, well, gee, you could just go and, and take a look at this dome and see those different lava flows. Well, that's no longer the case anymore, because what's happened is not only has the dome grown by stacking, but it's also grown from within. As fresh magma grows up within the St. Helens Dome, the surface distorts until you cannot see how it had grown. So St. Helens conceals its own eruptive history. The mountain is making the volcanologists rethink their interpretation of the geological past. But patterns have emerged to confirm a geological controversy, the influence of the moon. If we examine the timing of dome growth events in terms of the lunar tidal cycle, we notice that uh, most dome growth events have occurred within, say, three to five days after the tidal maximum. This is true with all of the dome growth events we've had so far, and statistically, you come out with something like a 99% chance that this is not random noise, that there really is a relation between the timing of the events and the tides. It's always controversial. You, if you wanted to uh, raise an argument among geophysicists uh, in a pub some evening, you can, uh, all, you can bring up the, the possibility of uh, tidal triggering of eruptions. But at St. Helens, I think we have a pretty clear-cut example of and it's some sort of interrelationship between them. The high technology left behind by the USGS keeps St. Helens wired for seismicity, magnetism, chemistry, and gravity. They have revealed the mountain's deeper secrets, the volcanic plumbing system. Earthquakes cluster below the mountain in a conduit going down. At four kilometers, the rock seems too soft to transmit earthquakes, suggesting a holding chamber of magma. The conduit continues until 12 kilometers where it disappears. Then the theory of plate tectonics takes over. The Earth's crust is constantly being formed in enormous plates at mid-ocean ridges. As new crust spreads apart, it meets another continental plate. One is subducted beneath the other. Friction melts the rock, creating intense pressure, which forces the melted rock to the surface as a volcano. Before we came in here and got on the ground, we imagined that this was going to be a very sterile place where everything had been destroyed and everything was dead. And what we found instead was that a lot of life, a lot of organisms, a lot of biological structures were left behind here. Look over here, Jerry. We've got some really interesting things here. It's so what we had here was an incredible richness of things to look at. And every time we turned around, there was something new and exciting and different and surprising. Now this is something new here, and a stink current's come up here. Uh, and here it is in bloom. We were being blindsided all the time. And I described it as being like a kid in a candy store, because there was so many things going on here. Uh, and I always loved the way in which we'd develop our ideas and concepts and theories 
and then would come in here and nature would just knock them on their pins, you know. It, uh, it wouldn't be that way at all. Now, more than a decade later, the St. Helens landscape is transformed. Dandelion, vine maple, fireweed have all blown in on the wind and thrive on decayed trees. For 10 years, biologist Charlie Crisofuli has been trudging through the St. Helens blast zone, trapping animals and charting their recovery. He clips the toenails so he doesn't count the same ones twice. Deer mice were found in the first summer. Too far from the edge of the blast to have walked in, they had somehow survived. The population now thrives. Voles, chipmunks, frogs, and salamanders all were survivors. When St. Helens erupted, late winter ice had covered small lakes and protected their waters from the blast. So there were many unexpected oases of life among the devastation. The best example is the pocket gopher. We found gopher surviving in nearly all disturbance zones. In fact, we found it surviving in 1980 above Spirit Lake, one of the most brutally hit places on the volcano. And the reason it did it is because of its peculiar uh, life history of living beneath the ground. The gopher in its burrow was insulated from the 300 degree blast. Flowing it up to 400 kilometers an hour, the blast was deflected by the hummocks and hollows of the hills. Occasional pockets of flora and fauna were sheltered from its worst effects. And up to those biological havens, the gopher eventually burrowed its way. What ends up happening is much like rototilling your garden. The gopher burrows down for root parts in the old organic soil and mixes that with the volcanic ash. And in doing so, increases the soil's ability for, to sustain plant growth. Biologically, it changes the soil. There are often seeds and root fragments and corms and bulbs in the old soil that are now brought to the surface and can subsequently germinate. And physically, it changes it by having a mound on a relatively flat surface. It increases the likelihood of seeds blowing across the surface to be trapped onto the mound. Every plant here owes its life to a gopher. These are the standing dead, trees scorched to death at the fringe of the blast. They will remain for centuries before decay claims them. Just a few hundred meters closer to the volcano is a valley that bore the last full force of the blast, Clearwater Creek. Forest managers from government and industry were eager to clean up nature's mess right away. After 10 years, the valley has had its blown down timber salvaged and thousands of fresh seedlings planted. Only the river itself and the stream banks were left undisturbed for scientists to study. The irony is that where the logs were allowed to decay, the blasted trees have speeded the recovery of stream life. These little uh, seeps here are a ubiquitous feature here in this whole blast zone. And they're a result of a lot of fragmented trees and organics buried with the ash and then water percolating through them. And in this percolation process, uh, it, it solubilizes or puts into solution a lot of metals and a lot of the nutrients that would feed the stream. And then when they come to the surface in these little seeps, they oxidize and turn this bright orange and then the algae respond, these big lush growths of green filaminous algae respond to that nitrogen and phosphorus that, that comes out. We refer to these as little nutrient pumps for a fairly nutrient poor stream. And these are just adding nitrogen, which is the limiting nutrient in these streams, uh, into the system and that moves on up through the fish food chain. Minerals feed algae, 
Algae feed plankton, plankton feed fish, and fish attract frogmen. Every season they creep up on the fish and count them. Many fish survive the blast, and their numbers have increased surprisingly quickly. Far from being damaged by the invasion of half a forest into their stream, the fish population flourished. Exposed to open sky and hot summer sun, they have faced water temperatures far higher than ecologists thought they could tolerate. The fish keep cool by hiding in pools of water cooled by the shadow of logs. So the decaying logs themselves have actually boosted the recovery of the fish. The fast flowing streams are also home to a rare little frog, the tailed frog, biologist Chuck Hawkins. The reason the frog is called the tailed frog is that approximately half of the population has this tail. And in fact, when it was first described, the function of this organ wasn't completely clear. Eventually, it was discovered that, in fact, it's what's called an everted cloaca. It effectively acts as a penis in this particular species. And it's the only frog in the world that has internal fertilization. The tadpole of the species is really the reason we're studying this particular frog. As you can see, it's a highly modified tadpole. Unlike most frog species, it has a sucker-like mouth, which it uses to cling to rocks and torrential habitats. You can see how effective that sucker is by how tightly it's clinging to my finger. The oral disc, or the mouth, takes up most of the bottom of the head, and it uses that disc both to cling to rock surfaces and also to pull itself along and feed on attached algae. The adult-tailed frog has the narrowest heat tolerance of all frogs. It likes cool, moist, dense forest. So its traditional home is deep in the last ancient forests of the Northwest. Yet in the blast zone, where cooling trees suddenly vanished, tailed frog populations rose dramatically. It turned out that the decaying timber and extra sunlight in exposed streams created an overabundance of algae for the tadpole to eat. So while the adults had a tough time, the tadpoles thrived. There's a bit of an evolutionary irony here in the sense that the tadpoles require different conditions than the adults, and as a consequence of that, uh, the overall ecosystem has to provide a mix of conditions if this species is to thrive. On the bare pumice plains near the center of the blast zone, Yet another scientific theory has been turned upside down. For years, Dr. Rick Sugg has been walking across baking pumice, pouring antifreeze into little plastic beakers and counting the hapless insects that crawled in by mistake. Today, the sterile pumice plains are still the most inhospitable new world remaining on St. Helens. With nothing to feed on, in theory, no living thing should have come back. But the theory was wrong. The population of insects has built rapidly. They simply blew in on the wind. Dr. Sugg's colleague, John Edwards. We had studied insect fallout on other mountains, but we were still really surprised when we came to look at the diversity. We think that the, at least a thousand, well over a thousand maybe, sp species of insects and spider that have fallen out on the, into our traps. The specimens range from green fly through mosquitoes, midges, gnats, beetles of all varieties, and a host of different insects that few people see outside the entomology textbooks. Much to their surprise, the insects that first crawled into the antifreeze were predators. Their food supply, a dead rain of insect bodies had blown in with them on the wind. Ecological theory had predicted that plant-eating insects would colonize before predators. St. Helens has shown that nature is more flexible than ecological theory. We had the problem of determining how many and what varieties of insects and what weight of insects were arriving on the mountain. 
and uh, we wanted to make a trap which would simulate the surface of the mountain and uh, we made many different attempts that didn't work and one evening I was cycling home past the golf practicing range and saw a large number of golf balls lying on the green there and it occurred to me that they were about the size of pieces of pumice. On an average summer's day on the mountain, the golf balls trap thousands of nearly invisible insects and spiders. And it seems a very barren, inhospitable sort of habitat. But that's because we look at it huge as we are in proportion to the size of an insect. We don't see the little micro environments that they can pop in behind a, a stone, uh, they can find a little crack in the ground. And so they are finding little habitats to live in that we would never dream were viable. But all of these animals are specialists and that's one of the reasons why they are strictly Act one, scene one of the ecological play, that uh, as soon as the vegetation arrives, as soon as the, the habitat begins to mature, they have, they're gone. We don't find them again. They've disappeared off looking for a new area of disturbed land. As soon as plants come in, of course, everything changes and the whole situation becomes very, very complex, much too complex for me. I like the simple habitats. The golf balls also trap seeds. Ecologists are studying the plants coming back very slowly to the most sterile landscape known. This tiny fir is the first in 10 years on the pumice. Its seed was probably blown in from the ridge overlooking the plain, from a patch of forest that had been shielded from the blast by the shape of the hillside or the cover of snow. There's a seed rain of species, generally light, buoyant, but these have small seeds and they don't grow in these conditions. If we look around and the species that do grow here, such as the lupin, have large seeds. And while they can grow here, they simply don't get here in ordinary circumstance. So this is the paradox of why it's so slow. The species that arrive commonly don't germinate and don't establish. The species that um, could do so fail to get here in any appreciable time. For reasons that no one is quite sure of, one or two heavy lupin seeds did make it onto the plains. Teams of botanists have been tracking the lupin population, measuring the same transect of ground each season. All 250,000 offspring from the first plant have been charted by a group from Utah State University. Lupins draw nitrogen from the atmosphere. As they die and decay, other plants grow in the nitrogen-rich soil they create. They're known as nurse lupins, for once they take hold, the variety of successful plants increases. Roger Del Morel has set up experimental plots on the mountain where he manipulates the world onto which seeds fall. The question is, what does it take to get these species to actually grow in this particular environment? And there are a number of possibilities. So for example, we have rows of rocks which endeavor to act as places for the seeds to actually lodge. Perhaps seeds simply blow away and never lodge in a place. We add nutrients to the soil. Perhaps they germinate, but they perish because they can't grow rapidly enough in a limited resource environment. We add a mulch to ameliorate the soil temperatures, things of this sort. So we look at these factors individually and then in combination, perhaps it takes uh, two or three things before a particular species can grow. One of the long-term goals of the research on Mount St. Helens has to do with the restoration of land, such as coal tips or open cast mining, things of this sort. Traditionally, people doing this sort of work look to the natural environment and they model their reclamation programs based on what they see in terms of the natural succession processes so that we foresee the ability now to achieve a, a very good result in a much shorter period of time by applying some of the principles that we're learning in these studies.
the 1980 blast spent most of its energy over private and commercial forest land. The Weyerhaeuser company salvaged the logs and replanted a carpet of green seedlings. This man-made uniform young forest is very different from nature's haphazard recovery. New plants growing among the seedlings provided a rich food supply for the elk herds that were decimated by the eruption. Zoologists who believed the elk required a sheltered forest environment to survive have been surprised at how well the animals have adapted to the new Mount St. Helens. The elk even venture onto the bare debris flow, tolerating temperatures far greater than scientists thought possible. Dr. Evelyn Merrill. Elk are able to manage with uh, heat in uh, several different ways. They can take on a lot of heat because they have a large body size. Secondly, they sweat quite a bit, and this is unlike deer who normally thermoregulate through panting. They become inactive, and when they become inactive, it helps out in several ways. First off, if you're not moving around, you're not generating heat yourself. So you've cut down your metabolic heat input. Secondly, many of these areas where vegetation did not come back very quickly, you would find them bedded with their entire surface area connected to the ground. So they pass heat from their body down to the ground itself. And you'll find them using wet areas, which become even uh, better conductors of the heat away from their bodies. So they seem to be able to cope with it quite well. Mount St. Helens and her volcanic sisters are less than one million years old, quite young by geological standards. St. Helens' ruthless and violent eruption unearthed many clues about their geological past. It also unveiled quite unexpected echoes of a far more distant past, biological evidence about the very beginning of life on Earth. Microbiologist John Barris. So essentially what I'm trying to do is go back to three to 3.5 billion years ago and say, what did the early Earth look like? And by coupling every prejudice that I have and, and ignoring all the shibboleths of science, I've decided that this was an Earth that was dominated by volcanism. It was an environment devoid of oxygen. Fairly high temperatures, what we call reducing conditions, a lot of hydrogen sulfide and reduced metals, et cetera, as the dominant energy sources. So I come up with that kind of biased view of what I think the early Earth looked like, and I say, where do I go to study this? Answer, Mount St. Helens. What Barris has found among the mineral-stained rocks surrounding fumaroles on the dome are bacteria. Bacteria living at temperatures over 100 degrees centigrade, living on sulfur and iron, forming threads on which steam condenses, they are not just ordinary bacteria. Using molecular biological techniques, we have determined that the bacteria that are actually growing at these extreme conditions of high temperature appear to be genetically very distant from the common everyday kinds of microorganisms that we live with. That these organisms are so different that they have dropped out into what we think is a separate kingdom. And some of the current thinking today is that there really are then three kingdoms of life. Living organisms have long been placed into two broad categories, common bacteria and everything else, plants, animals, everything. Now there may be a third category, archaebacteria, genetically the same as the organisms that began evolution three and a half billion years ago. I actually thought it was pretty extraordinary myself when I first found bacteria capable of growing at 100 degrees C, for example, on Mount St. Helens. Where did these archaebacteria come from? And so the questions come up, are they spores, are they pollen grains or something blowing in the air? And they're not. We are left with really only one conclusion, and that they're present somewhere down in the mountain. They're sitting there dormant somewhere, just waiting for the opportunity to grow.
this is highly, highly speculative stuff. And, and the question comes up is, you know, how did all of this start out and where did these organisms come from? Do they actually predate the Cascade Range, for example, on Mount St. Helens and imply that where they would be coming from would be... Uh, my expectations is they're not going to be similar at all uh, because that's just the way I'm trained microbiologically. If they turned out to be genetically very, very similar to the point where they may actually be identical species, then I think we would have to rethink you know, where these organisms came from and whether or not there is a linkage between terrestrial and submarine volcanism. Somewhere deep in the Earth's crust, there is another world of life. Back on the surface, our world is already taking over again. Along your way up here, you probably noticed Mount Adams in the back. Here. Mount Adams is an active volcano. To the south, you probably noticed Mount Hood. Mount Hood is an active volcano. And on your way out, Mount Rainier is an active volcano. For generations of scientists, Out of all the diverse studies of nature's recovery at Mount St. Helens, one unifying concept has emerged, biological legacy. Scientists now understand the importance of what survives and what remains. They know the profound value of biological oases protected by ice and snow, of spiders and seeds that blow in on the wind, of sunlight and decay, of animals that turn over the soil, and nutrients glean from the dead that speed the recovery of life. That is biological legacy. And it has made Jerry Franklin take a different view of nature. The magnitude of this disturbance and the importance of legacies here uh, really rubbed our nose in it. And then after we'd spent a couple of years here recognizing this, we sort of went back to other kinds of disturbances and took another look at them. The commercial forest around St. Helens regularly sustains such disturbances, extinguished and recreated by clear-cut logging, where every usable fragment of timber is scoured from the ground. Logging is the main industry of the Northwest. After a century of it, only five or 10% of America's untouched old growth forests remain. What grows instead is man-made, a uniform crop of little diversity, tended for 50 years, then cut down again. Old growth forests are trees hundreds of years old, rich with beauty and ecological value. But that value competes with timber value. Preserve them or consume them. Jerry Franklin believes that biological legacy has shown a middle road. We don't have to make such an incredible choice between either, you know, very simplistic agricultural type forestry systems on the one hand, where we cut everything and haul it off, or on the other hand, strictly preserve it, just lock it all up and throw away the key. What, what the legacy idea does is begin to give us some idea of how to practice forestry so we can have commodities, in reasonable amounts, and at the same time, we can retain these ecological values, or at least a lot of them, within our managed landscape. Biological legacy teaches forest managers to retain plenty of nature's mess when forests are harvested. Dead trees and large logs can become nurse logs for many other plants and trees. Legacy shows the wisdom of preserving areas of old growth within the managed forest. They nurtured the biological diversity, which helps the forest and the foresters as well. By building these, these kinds of forests that are more diverse, we build systems which have more of that resilience, more ability to take some kind of a stress and, and uh, tolerate it or recover from it. And 
particularly in times like present where we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty in terms of global environmental conditions. It's very important for us to have forests that have the maximum amount of ability to resist those kinds of changes or recover from them once they suffer them. Nature is very resilient, very resourceful, and we can learn a lot from her about how to treat these resources. Funding for NOVA is provided by Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management and technology services for defense, space and industry. And the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. For a transcript of this program, send $5 to this address or call 212-227-READ. This is PBS.